introduce our next speaker now is uh, Dr. Jonathan Biha, who is consultant electrophysiologist at uh, Guy's and St. Thomas's, and he will be doing a talk on devices for ICC patients. Hi, Lynn. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yeah, we can hear and see you. Yeah. Start. And let me just share my screen. Thanks. Lovely. We can see your screen as well. Oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry, two screens, apologies. OK, that should be coming up now with the main screen. Can yeah, you see it? We can see that, thank you. Yeah. Sorry for that. So thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Liam, and for the uh, for the invitation um, by Rachel and Elijah. Um, I'm going to talk about devices for, for patients with uh, inherited cardiac conditions. And actually, by and large, this is um, a, a talk really about devices because most of the, the considerations are really device considerations that are appropriate for all patients. Um, but there's some specific uh, indications that may be relevant. Uh, and this leads nicely in, into Soraya's talk, who's going to talk about um, consenting for patients. Um, much of this uh, has, has been released in a, in a recent uh, publication, which I would draw your attention to, which is the pacing and resynchronization guidelines from last year in Europace. And there's a, a few couple, a couple of nuances and new things in the guidelines uh, which talk about conduction system pacing, leadless pacing and new approaches to uh, pacing which may be relevant uh, in the future. Uh, so I'd recommend having a look at it. Um, there's a couple of new um, recommendations that I've just pulled out that may be relevant for the populations that have been discussed today. Um, <clears throat> firstly, it comes as no surprise that there's a, a recommendation for the use of, of imaging uh, to demonstrate structural heart disease that exists as part of the diagnostic workup for these patients with symptomatic bradycardia and any conduction disease that might require pacing. Um, we've heard already <clears throat> today and through the CLIP programme about genetic testing, uh, and that, of course, should be considered in uh, patients, particularly younger patients. The, the, the guideline states less than 50 um, as a class 2A indication with those in structural uh, and conduction disease. And I think as cardiologists, we're probably getting better at identifying these patients and making sure that we do the necessary tests prior to uh, device implantation. And this has important consequences because it may be that patients who have conduction disease may also be at risk of ventricular arrhythmias. And so we may need to consider a more complex device such as an ICD rather than uh, simply a pacemaker. There's also mention uh, of, of course, patients with rarer conditions like neuromuscular diseases where there's a slightly lower bar for pacing. Uh, so any uh, any second degree block, uh, AV block with or without symptoms carries a class one indication. Um, and uh, that's a lower bar than, than would be the case uh, without a neuromuscular condition. Uh, or indeed for, for these patients that carry neuromuscular uh, diseases that we know affect the heart, um, the guidelines also recommend uh, an EP study uh, where we pass catheters up to the heart to measure the HIS-V interval or HV interval. And this is quite a good way of screening for um, conduction disease in these patients. Uh, and where the HEV intervals are beyond 70 milliseconds, one would uh, recommend a pacemaker. Um, other conditions you've heard about already, uh, Rachel was discussing long QT syndrome and generally speaking, um, the, uh, the, the indications uh, are, of course, temporary pacing for electrical storm, that of uh, torsade or VT uh, in patients with a with a excess uh, QT and therefore vulnerable window, um, but also uh, a standalone device uh, such as an ICD for those with recurrent VT or recurrent syncope. Uh, there's usually a rare need for a pacing uh, as a standalone entity in adult patients, probably more so in the paediatric population. And in patients with uh, a cardiomyopathy associated with a lamin mutation, we know that uh, these patients uh, have often conduction disease as their initial presentation. It's often an early feature, but we also know that pacing, bradycardia uh, associated pacing is not protective uh, enough. Uh, and various different studies, including a large meta-analysis, has shown that uh, around 46% of patients who died suddenly already had a pacemaker. And as such, we would consider uh, uh, 
ventricular arrhythmia protection in the form of an ICD for these patients. And we know indeed these patients are followed up furthermore that about half of them have had appropriate therapy uh, by five years in those with a pacing indication. So I'd also just uh, plug uh, this website because uh, it's useful and has a lot of educational webinars uh, and we recently uh, put one uh, online for the ESC guidelines. Uh, so do go and have a look at it. It summarises the guidelines and some other uh, hot topics, particularly in arrhythmia, that talk about ICDs as well. So just uh, a note about that. So I was asked also to, also to mention uh, pacing in uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and uh, LVOT obstruction. Uh, we know that patients can become quite symptomatic uh, for a variety of, of reasons that I won't go into in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but we know that in patients who do have gradients across their LVOT, that there's various measures we can take that include various drugs, uh, myectomy, alcohol septal ablation, and also pacing. So the concept with pacing is, of course, that we try to shorten the AV delay and pre-excite the RV apex and therefore um, it can theoretically reduce an obstruction that may exist by the promotion of dyssynchrony. Um, however, practically it's less clear cut and actually apical placement or indeed placement of leads in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a bit more challenging. They often have a much higher burden of ectopy, which may make specific lead positioning quite challenging uh, and the evidence is less strong. You can see here that there is some good evidence that by pacing apically compared with the septum, uh, one can reduce the gradient. Uh, and most of this data comes from observational uh, studies with uh, N numbers of less than 100. Um, but there are some RCTs out there with uh, a trend towards improved symptoms uh, as well. And so currently this does exist in the uh, pacing guideline, but it currently exists within a 2B class uh, indication. And as you can see, pacing on its own uh, for symptomatic treatment of, of LVOT obstruction um, is really quite a weak indication um, unless there's uh, concordant uh, bradycardia or another pacing or ICD uh, indication or if they're particularly unsuitable for myectomy or don't want alcohol septal ablation. So those other two treatments uh, are really prioritised and pacing very much uh, comes as a, as a secondary measure. Uh, I've, I've had Little experience with this directly in patients, but I have to say haven't had a particularly positive experience with, with pacing actually improving symptoms. So I'd be interested to hear what colleagues think. The other interesting point about um, uh, about worth making really is, is the importance of bias and reporting. So this meta-analysis from Imperial colleagues recently published looked at both the unblinded observational studies as well as the randomised studies. Um, and as you can see from um, from the different plots, the non-randomised one on the left and randomised on the right, uh, that actually the odds ratio reported is significantly greater over eight um, in the non-randomised data as compared with 1.8 in the randomised data. And uh, this was with respect to the NYHA class, the improvement or supposed, supposed improvement uh, in uh, symptoms following pacing. So it, it really highlights the importance of, of randomised data and randomised trials that uh, allow us to influence uh, our practice. So just move on to, to ICDs. Um, this uh, is a picture of uh, Michal Murawski, who uh, effectively invented the ICD. His uh, mentor and boss, uh, Harry Heller, died of, of VT from sudden cardiac death, and he uh, moved to Baltimore and worked with M Morton Moa uh, to design a canine model of defibrillation, which he published uh, in the late 1960s. And this uh, uh, one, one or two decades later then uh, bore out the first human implant um, in 1980, which was a, a general anaesthetic implanted by a surgeon, was very, very big, 145 mils, uh, and was an actual thoracotomy procedure with epicardial patches. And we know that the ICD has evolved uh, since then with um, the introduction of endocardial leads that could be placed transvenously, which is the conventional ICD that we know today, with the ability to pace as well, so bradycardia pacing, and also the in uh, introduction of ATP, anti-tachycardia pacing in the early 90s, as well as a reduction in size of ICD uh, volume from, from 145 mils as it was back then to around 30 to 35 mils as it is now. <clears throat> 
So what are the, some of the um, clinical considerations that you might want to make if you are uh, implanting an ICD? Um, I think we, we probably already touched on the indications, but, but of course anyone surviving a cardiac arrest is class one indication for an ICD, uh, and that's what we would call secondary prevention. Uh, and of course, the more challenging implants are those in the primary prevention grounds where we are predicting that patients are at risk. Uh, and of course, there's been a number of talks at how we predict that um, and how we probably need to improve upon that in the future. Some of the clinical considerations that you might want to think about are uh, whether the patient actually has concomitant bradycardia indications or indeed CRT indication in the form of uh, having heart failure symptoms and in impaired ejection fraction. But also you need to think about the potential downsides of uh, an ICD uh, and, and devices in general. And so device related complications are important. The lead attrition rate is particularly important in the ICC patient because they are often surviving and outliving uh, their leads. We're not looking at implanting an ICD potentially for someone usually who is uh, later on in their life. These generally tend to be younger patients and therefore um, that we are hoping that the device will last several decades and this therefore has uh, implications. Uh, so device related complications. Um, there's various ones. Uh, I'd, I'd draw you to this very nice review in Jack from a few years ago that, that talks through all the different uh, <coughs> device related complications. But in essence, most of them are of the order of around 1% or less. Uh, if you're putting in a CRT, then LV lead displacement is probably a bit higher. Uh, but generally speaking, around 1% for most of these uh, complications. That being said, we know that if you put in more complicated devices with more leads, you get more uh, complications. This is a, a large registry from uh, Denmark who uh, collect data very nicely for devices uh, and are published widely on, the, on this. Uh, and you can see as you go down from a single chain pacemaker through to a CRTD at the bottom, the um, six month cumulative instance of complications goes up. So it's important to consider that uh, a single chamber ICD is actually different to a single chamber pacemaker. Uh, and even though um, people may think that an ICD lead is the same as a pacemaker leave, lead, it is not, particularly because of the attrition rates of that lead. Uh, and that's something I increasingly hear in, uh, in MDTs, particularly ICC MDTs, and I think it's important to, to bear in mind that ICDs do carry, um, <clears throat> carry higher risk or cumulative risk over the lifetime of that individual. So the Achilles heel of devices and ICDs um, specifically is, of course, the transvenous lead. Um, the defibrillator lead design is more complicated than a pacing lead. So in addition to having the conductor components for the pacing and sensing, it also has a coil um, that will allow um, sensing, but also conduction uh, of uh, high energies and delivery to the heart. And the attrition rates are very varied, actually. Uh, they used to be very, very high in the older series, as you can see here in the 1990s. Old series suggested attrition rates of well, 15, 16 percent at 10 years. The more recent series suggest a much smaller uh, attrition rate. Um, and there were some specific lead failures, um, particularly the Sprint for Dalis lead and the Riata lead that had specific structural uh, defects that now in retrospect, the, the industry and, and pacing community have learned from. Uh, but effectively, uh, these two leads are now not used anymore and, and industry have learned from these. But you can see that the rates of uh, rates of uh, lead failures have been quite significant in these two specific lead cohorts. So it's important to bear that in mind. Um, the other important consideration, and Rachel touched on this um, during her talk on CPVT, is the psychological impact of ICD shocks, whether indeed appropriate or inappropriate. Uh, of course, one wants to minimise uh, the shocks uh, by uh, programming, ensuring long detection times and probably the use of rate slowing medications. Um, but patients still do get shocks and they do get inappropriate shocks as well. Uh, and this study, this Swedish survey uh, pointed out that uh, in a cohort of 3000 patients with over a third receiving a shock, you can see that having a shock uh, significantly um, increased the likelihood of, of predicting uh, depression and mental health. Uh, the mental health impact of having an ICD should not be underestimated uh, and needs careful, uh, careful consideration. Uh, lastly, um, before I scare you completely into uh, ordering an ICD into uh, for, for your patients where relevant, this is a probably a nice case example where the picture says it all. 
uh, in respect to what can go wrong with um, uh, patients who have uh, ICDs. This is a young gentleman uh, whose care I've been involved with recently, uh, cared for by a number of colleagues across uh, across uh, Guys and St Thomas's, and he had a secondary prevention ICD when he was very young, and then had several transvenous systems initially with uh, the Rialto lead that I previously mentioned that required extraction, and then uh, a failed defibrillation uh, test requiring a, an extra uh, shock lead in his coronary sinus. That then wasn't working properly, and so he was switched to a subcutaneous device, which unfortunately uh, caused some oversensing. And he then had a tunneled epicardial ICD lead with an abdominal box, but unfortunately represented with a device related infection and needed that extracting as well. So you can see that even though these are great devices and, and highly complicated and work very well for most patients, there are some where uh, actually you can see they, there are a lot of complications and we need to just consider these as well rather than fire and forget when we implant them. So this brings us on nicely to the subcutaneous ICD. This is another option for ICD therapy, uh, a newer therapy really in the last 10 to 12 years. It's an entirely extravascular system. So it's a single lead uh, that sits on top of the sternum with a lateral uh, generator. Uh, the generator is larger. I've got one here so you can see holding it next to a, um, a transvenous ICD, how big they are in terms of the profile. Um, this was really developed to solve the Achilles heel of ICDs that is transvenous leads. Uh, and you can see from this initial study that, that there was successful defibrillation of patients uh, compared with uh, the transvenous uh, ICD. And even though the DFT requirements uh, were higher, this really uh, uh, has built into a large solid evidence base for subcutaneous ICDs from, uh, from these studies uh, amongst others. So the Effortless Registry uh, now published a few years ago showed excellent uh, shock efficacy compared with the transvenous ICD trials. Initially, the subcutaneous ICDs did show quite high uh, inappropriate shock rates, which was mostly from T-wave over sensing. Uh, and the, uh, the manufacturer of Boston Scientific have, have more recently introduced what they call a smart pass filter to reduce that inappropriate sensing. And more recent contemporary data suggests that the inappropriate shock uh, rates are indeed much lower and comparable to transvenous ICD, so somewhere in the region of three to five percent. And more recently uh, than that, a head-to-head -head trial, the Praetorian study published now uh, only a couple of years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine um, by Reynold Knops and uh, colleagues, was a direct comparison of subcutaneous versus transvenous ICD in 900 patients who did not have a bradycardia indication. Uh, and uh, over a five-year follow-up, this was a, a non-inferiority non trial. Uh, and interestingly, you could see that the on the right-hand side, the device-related complications were slightly higher with the uh, transvenous uh, ICD and uh, inappropriate shock rates uh, were, um, were slightly higher the other way around. So one is offset by the other, and there's, I suppose, equipoise in this sense. Uh, and further long-term data are going to uh, determine, I guess, whether we uh, whether the community uses one device rather than the other. But of course, currently, the SICD is not able to provide uh, any form of pacing, uh, and this is perhaps something uh, for the future, which I'll come on to in a second. So I suppose one of the other questions is, does everyone need uh, ATP? And you can see from the pain-free study on the left that uh, ATP is highly effective at painlessly terminating VT and reducing shocks. Um, but you should also note that on the left hand side, you can see about a third of the patients had spontaneous termination of the VT, which lasted for around 10 seconds in most patients. So uh, therefore, not everyone does need ATP. And that's really the argument for the uh, subcutaneous ICD in uh, in the population of ICC patients that we may be considering it. The other thing on the right hand side from the Madit Ritz study is that if if you know you if you prolong the detection interval uh, for VT, you can significantly reduce the rates of shocks because many of the VTs will indeed uh, terminate. So we do know that in some patients it would be reasonable to uh, implant them with a subcutaneous ICD. In others with more sustained symptomatic VT, uh, having the ability to deliver ATP is obviously going to be uh, beneficial. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to move on to the, the kind of future of pacing and leadless pacing. Um, Predominantly, the transvenous system has been the same for 60 years. And really, in the last five to 10 years, we've seen this real disruption in technology, the miniaturization of technology into a single unit that 
contains the electrodes, the computer, the battery. As such, you can implant one of these uh, leadless pacemakers via transcatheter technique via the uh, femoral vein up into the IVC across the valve and then take the catheter away and leave the implant in situ. There's therefore no lead and no pocket. Uh, and, and these implants are very successful uh, in terms of the acute major complication data, which is very, uh, very low and comparable to the transvenous systems, but also the medium term uh, complications as well uh, that are indeed directly comparable to transvenous pacing. The problem with leadless pacing up till now has been that we really have only had a limitation of single chamber VVI pacing in a much smaller population that we would normally offer uh, the pacing to. So patients with permanent AF, vascular access issues, uh, device infections. Uh, and now this has really been expanded uh, using the uh, the micro AV to uh, atrial sensing, not pacing, just atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. So VDD mode of pacing. And this allows patients who have a, uh, a reasonable sinus node function to have AV synchrony, uh, which you can see from this um, uh, diagram on the right hand side. And indeed, that actually does improve uh, does improve cardiac output, as was demonstrated in uh, the Marvel and Marvel 2 studies. Uh, and even further more than that, the uh, Avir, which is uh, made by a different company, uh, can deliver dual chamber pacing, both in terms of the atrium and the ventricle. And this was a, a implant done just last month in Oxford uh, by Tim Betts and colleagues. So this is actually having two leadless systems in situ, one in the atrium, one in the ventricle, both sensing, both pacing with the ability to wirelessly communicate communicate uh, between uh, them. And so this really offers the possibility of having leadless pacing alongside ATP, which you can see uh, from this study that was done in sheep, uh, looking at the SICD with a leadless device that's able to deliver uh, ATP. In addition to that, there's the opportunity to deliver leadless LV pacing, so-called YCRT, and that can also be delivered with uh, leadless uh, A and V pacing. So there is the potential in the future to really deliver leadless pacing in the A, both the ventricles and have a subcutaneous ICD without having any leads uh, in the heart, but we're not quite there yet. And just before I close, and this hopefully leads nicely into Soraya's talk, it's really important that, that the decision over a device is a shared decision, something that is driven by uh, the patient and that they have the right information at the time. And that's not just the information that would talk about the device and how we put it in and the complications, but actually the potential lifetime risk, which I think is really, really important for our ICC patients, particularly because many of these patients, we hope, are going to outlive their device and going to need several iterations, several versions of the device of battery changes going forward. So it's important that they are uh, empowered uh, to uh, have the right information. And we're using uh, a variety of, of different tools, including animations to, uh, to do this at GSTT. I think I'm gonna stop because I'm probably out of time, but happy to take questions. Thanks, Lynn. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. That was really a good overview and a summary of uh, devices in, in, in all our patients. Uh,